Uh, hello, my name is Perry Hurt. I'm a painting conservator at the North Carolina Museum of Art. It's really nice to be here with you today, and I hope you're doing well. Uh, so let's talk about Claude Monet and the French Impressionists and their paint materials. Uh, so what's the big deal? What's so different about the Impressionist paint? Uh, simply put, a radical change in artist pigments during the 18th and 19th centuries enabled a revolution in painting. A new palette of paint, which uh, made it physically possible for the artist to make something brand new, something new that, that painting had never had before. By the middle of the 16th century, during the Renaissance era, uh, the painters, the oil painters palette was pretty much well established. Um, if we look at the pigments that, was on, that were on that palette, uh, you see about 14 listed here on the slide, but in actuality, they're probably closer to 30, but about half of those were, uh, had a lot of problems. They were very expensive, uh, they were hard to work with, some were very rare and, and hard to get, and others were seriously poisonous. Or you could have any combination of all those problems with those pigments. So it really boiled down to about 14 or 15 pigments. If we look at these pigments, you really get a feeling of how old and traditional they are. For instance, uh, the oldest pigments on the palette are yellow ochre, black, and red earth, which were used by our prehistoric ancestors going back a thousand years, uh, if not hundreds of thousands of years in use. Then others on the palette were made by the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, uh, even the ancient Romans, and then quite a few are from the medieval period, well before the Renaissance. By the time you get to the Renaissance and the 17th and 18th century, only a very few are added to the palette. So in, in reality, almost nothing changed on the oil painter's palette in the previous 300 years before Impressionism. Uh, nearly every painter, oil painter, before uh, the Impressionists used this group of paintings, uh, excuse me, uh, group, used this group of pigments. Uh, if we look at the arrangement on the palette, and you are, we see this in all the cell portraits that we look at just about, you see what's called a tonal uh, organization of the paint. Uh, it goes from light to dark. In this case, uh, the way the pigments were, the, the pigments that were available, this, this swings through the yellow, red, and brown side of the spectrum. Uh, the blues were tended to be isolated on the palette because they were expensive and easily polluted. Now, there's a lot of problems with this uh, uh, palette of colors that may not be obvious when you look at it this way. There are a lot of weak pigments, transparent pigments, dull pigments. Uh, there was also no green on this palette. It's hard to paint a landscape if you don't have green. So, so the artist, if they were skilled enough, could mix those expensive blues and those dull yellows to create greens. And that kind of leads us to the point that uh, to be a good painter, to be someone who could really make a realistic scene out of these limited pigments, you had to compensate for all of the gaps and inadequacy of the pigments that were, were available at the time. Uh, and, and as we know, many, many artists were able to pull this off and make beautiful paintings. But things started to rapidly change in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, the new birth of modern chemistry uh, led the way. People like Antoine Lavoisier, uh, better known as the father of modern chemistry, and his wife, uh, Marie Anne, were uh, one of many different new scientists who pursued the basic building blocks of the world around them, that is, the elements themselves. Before Lavoisier, about 15 uh, elements were known. Uh, but, but even at that, they were poorly understood. By the end of his time and going into the 19th century, at least 40 new elements were discovered. It's no coincidence that the Industrial Revolution and the birth of modern chemistry happened at the same time. They really fed off of one another. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was largely due to advances in science. The population explosion that happened about the same time created a huge uh, demand for new products. New products were much more marketable and more valuable if you could add color to them. So in turn, the scientists would go and, and try to discover a new element, a new material, and they'd very quickly try to figure out if they could make a new color out of that. And boy, did they find a lot of new colors. So here's just a few examples. Here's three elements that were discovered during this time and the dates that they were discovered. We have cobalt, chromium, and cadmium. And then in, right next to them, you see those colors, uh, patches of color with uh, the dates in those where those specific pigments 
were invented from those elements. And you can see quite a very uh, variety of different colors here, greens, yellows, reds, blues. And I'll point out specifically the three greens. As I said before, there was no good green pigment on that traditional palette. And now we have quite a few of them. And in fact, more than 20 new pigments were invented in the 100 years before the Impressionists uh, invented uh, uh, the Impressionist style that we've come to know. Uh, anytime there's a new material that comes onto the art market, uh, artists are very excited about it and they quickly grab it as a chance to innovate. Um, and so certainly all the existing artists, as these pigments came on the market, they adapted them to their traditional palette. They would, they would put them on, on there with all the other traditional pigments that we've talked about. But with this massive explosion in the number and the quality of these new pigments, there was bound to be a corresponding uh, tidal wave of innovation. And the Impressionists are that innovation. They took the inherent qualities of these new pigments to create something new that had never been part of our history before. So now the Impressionists had the whole rainbow of pigments at their fingertips. And they uh, correspondingly reorganized their palette to exhibit this. And we see this in self-portraits and, and other examples like the one we have on the screen where the artists actually organized the pigments according to the rainbow, that, that chromatic order that we see uh, illustrated in a modern color wheel. These uh, pigments were actually pretty amazing in the fact that they could use fewer pigments than had been used before, even though they had more pigments available to them because of these brand new pigments that had just come out, the quality of the pigments and their understanding of prismatic light uh, allowed the uh, Impressionists to use fewer pigments than anybody before them had actually used to create a fully colored scene. So here we have an example of a painting called A Palette with Landscape by Camille Pizarro from about 1879. Here he uses just six pigments to make a fully colored landscape, starting at the top, uh, excuse me, top right, going counterclockwise around, we have lead white, which is an ancient pigment, chrome or zinc yellow, a new pigment, Vermilion, which is ancient. Uh, alizarin crimson, probably it says Red Lake uh, in the in the uh, research here, but it's probably the new alizarin, alizarin crimson. Then we have French ultramarine, which is new, and emerald green, which is new. These are a very good approximation of a balanced color wheel. If you place them on the color wheel, you'll see that they are very evenly spaced around, and that we gave Pizarro the the ability to mix all these colors to create any color in nature that he needed to make this scene. So now moving back to Monet, Monet had been painting for a while before Impressionism was invented. And we know from analysis of his earlier paintings that he would use as many as 13 pigments in creating a painting and probably half of those would be traditional pigments and half new. 10 years into true Impressionism, his palette had changed dramatically. He would use no more than eight or 10 pigments to create a painting and all but one or two of those would be brand new pigments. His new palette was almost totally dominated by the new pigments. So here in, in the cliff at your top sunset, our painting at the North Carolina Museum of Art, we see a beautiful example of what the Impressionists and Monet were able to do. He's physically out on the coast of France, far from the studio, setting up his easel on the side, maybe on a beach, maybe in a grassy area, and looking at this dramatic sunset in front of him over the sea. He's able to paint quickly and confidently and capture the sparkling play of the light on the water, that mottled blue quality of the cliff itself, the sinking orange sun, and this dramatic, colorful uh, uh, sunset. Uh, and, and we have to remember because of what we've been talking about with the new pigments. No artist before Monet could have captured this sunset in this quality and this beautiful quality without the new pigments that had just recently been invented during his time. 